All right, now we're coming back with part two of our Stephen King Stephen King, life. Di- Stephen King uh, discussion of basically his films and you know overall general consists, including mainly his films though. So now we're getting now to uh, Dead the Dead Zone, which came out in nineteen eighty two or eighty three. Eighty three. Starring Christopher Walken. Based off his novel from 1979. Yep. And this stars Christopher Walken as Johnny Smith. And uh, I didn't really, as a big Stephen King fan, I didn't get to finish this one, so don't ask me this one. Well, I finally watched it, and uh, this one is about a, a guy named Johnny Smith. He's a, he's a, a teacher, and basically he has a great life. You know, he's with his girlfriend and everything. Um, one day he accidentally gets into a car wreck and it leaves him in a coma for five years. And basically when he wakes up after five years, he discovers that, uh, there's, he basically has the ability to basically see the future and he's, he wants to try to help people and try to prevent future things from happening in the future as well. So he can basically do kind of like what Final Destination does where characters are able to see visions and shit. He basically tries to prevent that from happening. Mm-hmm. And it's actually a pretty great, damn good movie. Like, I I will say that um, I watched it recently when I was on vacation a week ago, and I really got into it, especially they have some really fucking creepy scenes where, uh, like, when he first wakes up, he starts noticing a child burn inside this house, and he, he notices it's like a vision or something. Mm-hmm. And he uh, basically tells the girl who who's the mother of the child to go to that house. Yeah. And they go there, and they actually are able to save the girl from mm-hmm. burning. So, throughout the film, they're basically getting, like, he's basically seen a lot of premonitions that are happening, kind of like Final Destination, and he's telling all these people that whatever's happening, that things are going to probably end up turning bad unless they stop it. Yeah. And so, um, and not, not just that, but it also deals with him very on an emotional level. Christopher Walken, like, is fucking great in this movie. Like, he, yeah. not only does he great, does he do great a lot in the, in the really, you know, the subdued parts, but also he does it very emotional too, because you really feel bad for him because his girlfriend ends up getting married after five years after he went into a coma yeah. and all that. And, and, uh, and also there's that, there's a subplot involving Martin Sheen as this, uh, Senator that's, tr- that's this guy that's running for Senator. And in a way, a lot of people have compared, uh, well, I'm not going to go on political, but I'm just saying some people have brought this up. Uh, People that are really big into politics, they compared this guy in this film pretty much to Donald Trump. Like, he's the basically the future version of John, Donald Trump, basically. Mm. Um, but anyway, it's a great story. It's a great movie. Like, I, I do highly recommend it. It's, it's really shocking in some parts, and it, it's a lot more drama than, 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 than <coughs> what it used to. Than yeah. what it used to, but it, it does mix up some pretty intense shit. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, overall, I would probably get maybe an 8.5 out of 10. Um, it maybe could have maybe done some more like uh, premonitions and things like that, but you know, it, for what they give it us, it was a great yeah. it was a great movie. Okay. And then after that movie came out uh, in two thousand in the early two thousands, they did this min- this TV series called mm-hmm. The Dead Zone as well, mm-hmm. where you had the uh, mm-hmm. where you had the kid from uh, Vacation play Rusty off of there playing uh, Johnny. And in that that TV series, they were able to go into a lot more detail of what Johnny could do to see all these premonitions and stop it from happening. That's cool. So, overall, it's a great film. Um, I do highly recommend it, especially if you're a big Stephen King fan. Because I know a lot of the fans from the book, they, they enjoyed it as well. Yeah. So, um, it's definitely one of my favorite uh, performances from Christopher Walken. So That's cool. All right, so in the same year we get 1983, we get the famous Red Car Killer Christine, mm. which is directed by John Carpenter. Yeah. And music done by John Carpenter. And it stars Keith Gordon, John Stockwell, Andrea LaPaul, Robert Prosky, and Henry Dean Stanton. And this film, I remember this film, like, I, I, this is one of those films I, all right, I had to watch. It took me a long time to watch. It took me until, like, the mid-90s, late-90s, early 2000s to watch. I think it was early 2000s to watch. My dad used to have a car, and my mom used to always refer to it as Christine. Oh, yeah? And I, later in the 2000s, I fi- after two years after my dad got rid of the car, I finally realized why she called it Christine. And it was actually the replica of Christine of the movie. Damn, really? Yep. And basically, it plays this car where this guy, he's dealing with a lot of bully issues. You know, your typical bully issues. Yeah. 
Yeah. Which is another thing. Not yeah, he's a nerd. Off, but, not to cut you yeah. off topic, but I noticed that a lot of Stephen King movies, like uh, adaptations, didn't you notice that they always use fucking bullies in a lot of their movies? Yeah, he does. He does, and it, it, it's basically, um, it's about a uh, they have a shop class together where they do automotive shit, mm. and basically it's this bully's picking on Arnie. He's the main character, and Arnie hangs out with some, you know, losers and all that stuff, and ba- basically losers. And he owns a car, and he fixes his car up, and his car. Pretty much, I can't remember the the whole how it took reform of like a, like a like a monster, uh, kind of like supernatural. Yeah. I, can't, I can't remember that sto- that plot how it did that, but all I can remember was with the boy. He obsessed with this car. This car gets him hot dates. He drives around pretty much like your monster version of Bumblebee. Is pretty much got you where it does stuff for him, but then it overtakes him and he becomes overdrawn over it. And he's kind of pretty much now part of the fucking car. And you could see this guy who was a nerd become a okay, I'm gonna knock some bullies out to I'm a badass to now the car's really fucking taking over my body Damn. and I'm really fucking evil and I lose my life and I die. Type shit, and then the car becomes evil, and he runs and kills people in the Damn. school. Yeah, and he's fucking brutal, and it's a classic. And uh, like I, I mentioned earlier, in some of the like Cujo, this is directly from his book that actually got praised. Another fucking scary film that I do relatively see a lot of people praise. And I remember from what I remember of it, it's guy, fr- the main guy who plays the kid who owns the car that turns evil is the same kid that played in Back to School with. Roger, Ron, Rod, Rodney, Rodney, Rodney Dangerfield, and uh, yeah, he played really good. I remember it was a class eighties uh, slasher film. You know, it's one of those films that is really good. You probably, but then again, you're like, oh, I'll watch another twenty years and stuff. Go back to classics, but it's a really good film to own of his classics. And yeah, out of yeah. out of a lot of the John Carpenter films, that's one I still have not this day watched. I remember it did some fucking brutal ass fucking running people over and killing people and shit. So well, I was kind of spoiled because I watched the top ten list. I did. I am aware of the scene where the boy gets pretty much ran over by uh, the car. Mm-hmm. That's the only scene I know of, of that yeah. got fucking spoiled to me because yeah. of the top ten list I watched. But then again, at times it could be like you can go years without watching it. So, overall, it was a really good adaptation, you know, from what I can remember. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah, I still need to check out Christine as soon as I get a chance to because I'm trying to do this Stephen King marathon until uh, the 8th of September. Yeah. So, the next one... Which I I do hear mixed reviews for. I'm sorry, but I easily put this in this top ten. Because, really, the first movie fucking terrified me. And to this day, even though it doesn't terrify me, it's such a fucking good fucking original film. 1984's Children of the Corn. Oh, yes. Now, this Ooh. is one that I grew up with a lot. Based off of. a 77 short story. Yep. At, which yeah. I actually have. Uh, the book I have called Night Shift, which has a series of collection of short yeah. stories, it actually has Children of the Corn in there that I need to read. Mm. So, anyway, yeah, this is the one where basically, as we know, the, for those of you who are pretty much aware of it, uh, you got a small town in Nebraska where you have these, these basically a, a town that's pretty much um, very seclu- iso- isolated because um, uh, you have... Basically, what it is is the original... All right, we're gonna, this is going to be a long topic because this is one that spawned a huge fucking franchise. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll basically keep a lot of the sequels brief yeah. Uh, yeah. because we don't want to go too much detail because we want to talk about other yeah. stuff. So, 84, Children of Corn. This one was my ultimate favorite. And I'm sorry, but I think this is easily his top ten. This is fucking a terrifying fucking film. Not only terrifying, but something about it just makes me draw back to it. This, this is also the first time I actually praised... Stephen King for his score. Yeah, the score in this score movie was, was fucking great. amazing. The first time I ever actually liked a score from any of his films. And anyways, it starts out with a family. It starts out with uh, Bert and his wife are heading to Seattle for because he became a doctor in Chicago and he's transferring to Seattle. They're going through 
uh, Gatlin, Nebraska, and they accidentally run over this kid. And this is also one of the few films that actually showed a kid getting his throat kicked. Yeah, like I remember that shit. It was fucking and, brutal. Yeah, slit his fucking throat and all that shit, dude. And they run him over, and pretty much they're trying to find help in this town, this desert town called Gatlin. And it's basically um, Isaac. This town was overran by a cult of children who believed in who he, who walks behind the rose is like a devil worshiping type cult thing. Where they are told to kill all the parents in town. Yeah. And these these kids murder all their fucking parents in gruesome fucking ways. Even the beginning of the film when it shows where they, like, they start going to that restaurant and they start slitting their fucking throats. Yeah, that tearing, was fucking terrifying. And tearing their fucking hearts out and making that dude like touch the saw and saw his arms yeah. hand off and shit. And then like... So Bert's trying to find like, you know, help in this town and he doesn't realize is overran by these cults. And these kids, and you got this guy that played Isaac, which was fucking creepy, dude. I believe at the time, I think he was about, what, 16, 17? The guy, the actor that played him, had suffered from, like, a disease or some shit. Yeah. Where it made him look, like, fucking weird, dude. But he played Isaac. Then, guys, we later on learned that the famous Melakai was played by... I cannot remember the actor's name. Oh, uh, shit. L- look him up. Um, yeah, I remember him because he was also in uh, ha- Rob Zombie's Dor- Halloween 2. T- Halloween, the first one, actually. No, this, well, yeah, the, the first one. The one he right. breaks out of the, the, the Saints Asylum. He also plays in Thorn Days. Yeah, that's right. I remember him. Yeah, he's the bald dude. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Believe it or not, here's a funny story about that. Um, well, speaking of the guy, the actor... Um, Sandy something, I forgot the guy's name, or no, um, it was something else, I, I look him up real quick, but basically, yeah. this actor, believe it or not, a friend of mine that I know, he's actually met that Courtney guy. Gaines. Courtney That's Gaines, yeah. yeah. My friend on, on Facebook, uh, my friend Charlie, he's actually interviewed him. He actually yeah. went to a, a convention and actually got a chance to meet him in person and do an interview with him. Yeah. And the guy played a fucking creepy-ass Melikai, yeah. dude, where he's stabbing motherfuckers and he killed children, dude, yeah. and all that. And he's doing behind eyes back, eyes is back. But, and this is with Linda Hamilton played in this role. Yeah, this is like the the and, same year as Terminator. Um, uh, fuck, uh, what's-his-face played in it, too? Um, Peter Horton. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Because this was the same year that Linda Hamilton did Terminator, but I think this was, yeah. I think she shot this one before she did Terminator, though. Yeah, and dude, talk about man, they did some. Fu- not only that, where they had to fight, he he walks down the roads and all that. This is like the more devil worshiping of them all, dude. It is, yeah. Like this was a fucking terrifying film, and to this day, even though I don't find it as terrifying, even though my uncle used to torture us with fucking cornfields and shit when I seen this film, yeah. This film still holds up. It's still a fucking yeah. pretty good film. I mean, it's got some questionable effects at the end, but I still overall enjoy it. I I fucking love it. I think it's the best no, of the series. It, one thing I do kind of a nitpick, though, kind of ends weird. Like, abruptly all of a sudden. You know what I said? Like, they're getting in their car, all of a sudden the fucking credits start rolling. It's like, well, no, they kill that one girl that they thought they killed, but if you would have rewatched it, you would understand the ending. Yeah, I know. It just, it, it, I thought it just kind of ended a little abruptly. That's all. I thought it ended really good, especially when like, like they they tie Isaac to the fucking cross. Yeah, that was creepy. And then he comes back. He's like, real guy. Yeah, dude, that fucking film was fucking still holds up. It man. still does. Yeah. Yeah, graphically and practically, it still fucking holds up. So. Without further ado, man, this was the best of the fucking Children of Corn franchise. I'm going to give this one a 9.5 out of 10, man. I really, with the score and everything, dude, I thought it was executed really good. Yeah, I I, I feel like it is about a, about a 9 out of 10. It's still good, mm-hmm. like really great. Um, then they did the sequel, Children of yeah. Corn 2. Now, which, I haven't seen that since in a while, so I... I know that basically in this story that this picks up like right was it right before it was the end, right or the, or next like day, the next day yeah, the so next day so this thing. is the only one that actually stays in continuity yeah though I did from what I remember though they did kind of fuck up on some continuity stuff in that one though yeah like because uh. 
Because in that one, if I remember correctly, there were people in the town that were pretty much, you know, aware of the situation, but didn't tell them before. Or I don't remember how it went, but there were some continuity yeah. issues that they fucked up on. They was, but not strongly. It still held up. The dude did very good as the next, pretty but, much, Isaac. Yeah. He did pretty creepy. He was really creepy. Um, it wasn't on. It wasn't on par with part one. Yeah, but it was still cool that they were able to mix in more adults but it still, this time. It did still feel the same. With the, the, the body count was bigger because they also added more like grown ups this time. Not only that, this one actually uh, um, revealed that the cornfields in Gatlin was built under an Indian burial ground. That's interesting. I like yeah. that. Which kind of made it devilish Indian type shit. So yeah. it revealed that, which was a really good sequel. I thought it was pretty good, and it had some pretty bloody cutting, and especially when that dude was bleeding out of his fucking nose. Ah, was that out. was fucking gruesome. Yeah, yeah, it was a gruesome. I will say for a sequel, it was really good. That one, I did say it dropped down a little bit for eight out of ten for me. Yeah, that's probably how I would agree because it's been a while since I remember. It. I love the first one so much. Um, then you get the third one, which they kind of did the urban setting. Yeah, I give Eli. He was creepy. The guy who played Eli was fucking creepy in that movie. But other than that, because really... that, yeah, that one was that at that point. Because keep in mind, the first two films were released theatrically. The third film was actually released direct to video. This was yeah. the first time that Dimension Films got a hold of the rights, and they were starting to release some direct to video. Yeah. Um, so when that film came out, it was basically showing that uh, they wanted to kind of change it up. Uh, but to me, though, the fucking say just doesn't work because the fact that it's even in though the they city, try to change it up, yeah, yeah I, I feel like a city up. saying just does not fucking work. Yeah. So basically, I felt kind of like six out of ten, five point five out mm -hmm. of ten in this one. Fourth one was more of a forgettable. They go back to Gatlin again. No, it's actually not in Gatlin. It's somewhere else, I think. I thought it was in Gatlin. Well, anyways, they do kind of more virus thing with yeah. this one. Though it was the debut of Naomi Watts, and I thought she did pretty good. Yeah. So. so this one ended up, you know, it was yeah, it was not much described other than a virus when like, these kids go crazy, yeah. become children corn. They didn't really have a leader in this one, which was the first time they didn't really have a leader. They were just two kids, basically, I think, or yeah. there were a few of them. It was more of a virus. Yeah. yeah. So then that one dropped to me, it's man. Like a I five out of five ten. Five out of ten. Yeah. Then five, five was a brought it kind of back, man, because this one is my third favorite of the franchise. Yeah, and you—that's the one that your uncle had you watch, right? You went yeah. to Blockbuster. Yeah, I went to Blockbuster and watched that one. Children Corn 5, uh, Fields of Terror, this one actually brought back where the kids were bringing back. Though, I did fell, find the guy who was kind of playing the Isaac equivalent. He played from step by step. I thought he was kind of underwhelming as the Yeah, leader. I could see that. Though, yeah. that... It had some, like, kind of... It had a couple of stars in there, I Yeah, Mendez. Like, Eva Mendez. Mendez. This Eva was, like, Mendez. her debut. Yeah, debut. And then you also had the dude from uh, uh, Brian Chucky in there, too. Yeah. This one jumped up to about a 7 out of 10 for me. Yeah, this one was a great return because... Well, first of all, this was... At, believe it or not, if I remember growing up, I think this was the second one I watched uh, from growing up after I watched the first one. Because I never watched the two through, through, through four. See, I, 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 I actually I stayed watched, continuity, I, and then I kind of... Didn't really see four, and then I seen five, and then I watched four. Yeah, either that or if I remember correctly, I think five might have been my first one, and then first one. But yeah. either either way, see, basically I'm from the eighties, yeah, so I, I seen the first one. So. Well, the fifth one, it was the one that got me interested because yep. it, when at the time when I was collecting VHS tapes. Um, I was going to Blockbuster a lot and written VHS tapes. And it has and a I 90s saw that fucking, feel. Get some saying, yeah, yeah, with the music and all that. Now with that, it has that fucking famous dude that hung himself in it. That, really? Jonathan played, Brandis? Huh? Jonathan Brandis? No, the fucking dude from Kung Fu TV series. David uh, something from Kill Bill. Oh, yeah. Uh, David... David... Uh, I forgot his Costello or some shit like that. He actually played in this, and he played... He, he He's the guy who can speak to he walks beyond the rose. Yeah, that's right. And he becomes like some cockroach at the fucking end or some weird shit. But anyways, it was my third favorite of the franchise. So that then, then when we get to six, seven, eight, nine, and ten, I'm gonna tell you right now, I am so spot drunk with these. They get fucking terrible yeah. as they go. Six, I remember watching when it came out. Um, I didn't remember much of it until years later. I remember just kind of being not kind of forgettable. I, I will praise him for bringing the guy back. Yeah. 
they got the same guy to play Isaac come back. Yeah, but I just remember, Isaac returns. I remember yeah. watching. I was just kind of like, it was just kind of forgettable. They didn't really yeah. do much with it. They did. I really probably would have gave that one like a four point five, maybe a it, five out of ten. I would give it, it kind of like four point five. Yeah, yeah. Then when we got to fucking seven revelations, that's when I was like, okay, this right here, you fucking dropped the ball, movie. Yeah. Because this movie right here, George of the Revelations. First of all. How the fuck are you gonna have a, a fucking cornfield in a in a apartment building? And no, that this woman stays in the same apartment complex the whole movie, and she it, it comes out of her bathtub or some bullshit. Yeah. It's like okay, this is this is just like so fucking cheaply done. Yeah, you, you're only doing it in one room the whole fucking movie. Yeah, and plus not just that, but there's this weird subplot involving this priest that goes fucking nowhere. I'm like. What the fuck is this movie? I don't get it. So, and then, when it comes to seven, they this is when the series ends up going one out of ten the rest of yeah, the fucking way. Though you didn't finish it, so you can't really judge it. Yeah, but I'm but gonna I, go one out of ten with Revelations of. I gave that what's one the probably next one, a, Genesis. Yeah, but I haven't seen that one. Um, is that, that the last one of the uh, of the sequels? Of the sequels? Yeah. Um, well, what I was gonna say was with Revelation. I probably give that maybe a one out of ten as the worst that I saw uh, of the sequels, basically. Mm-hmm. Now, before we get to Genesis, well, do you mind? We can't really talk about Genesis. We can't because, talk Genesis because we haven't we both, seen that. We one. both haven't seen it. But for my understanding, it's actually ten times worse than Revelations. That's no doubt. Yeah. So if that's the case, and we would give it a one out of ten. So I seen the reboot. Yeah, I haven't seen the remake. In 2010, I 2009. believe. 2009. 9 is when I it came out. I think it was. Yeah, 2009. 2009. This fucking movie. Oh, my fucking God. This, to me, is one of Stephen King's adaptations worst ever created. Even Sounds. worse than The Shining? Yeah. Yes. This one is ungodly unwatchable. I think I actually rate this in my top 20 worst films ever made in history. It is wow. that fucking bad. It this film literally starts out the this white dude who's playing Bird again, the reboot of the first one, and it's black girl because we have to do demographics and all that stuff. So she plays his wife, and this is when instead of doctor, he comes out of Vietnam War. It says Vietnam War. Is it Vietnam or Gulf War? One of the wars. So anyways he comes out and he's all fucked in the head and he's like 80% of this movie, him and fucking his wife are bitching about what the shit he's seen in the war and asked why we were in the war in the fucking first place. That would be fucking boring. Then they show some scenes where the kid's throat's cut, but they don't even show it because it's for fucking... T- well, I know there was that it, clip that they you showed made me it. where the kid got run, in, run over. Yeah, they show that, but they don't even... Sh- they're more gory in the original than this. They don't even show that scene at all. <laughs> the dude that played Melokai is pretty good. The guy who played Isaac was really terrible because I think he was too young for that role. Though, I did like they did where the, the whole story where Isaac... In, uh, all right, in the original film, Linda Hamilton and her husband are going through Gatlin and they hear this guy talk about... There ain't no room for the fornicator, you know, and all that shit. They're like it's kind of like a gospel shit for religion. Yeah. But in the new version, it's Isaac talking, which I did praise that. I will give that. But literally, if you guys seen the original Children of the Corn film, this movie actually practically ends at the part where they get ready to capture Burton and, and Linda Hamilton's reboot character, and Bert talks to the children out of it and it talks about the shit he's been through and he actually talks to them and the movie's over. That's weird. They just fucking let him go? That's it. He cared it. <laughs> Apparently, hey, yeah, you know, I've been through some shit, you know, hey, it's not the way to go, you know, you think you guys rule it all this, blah, blah, blah. and it's over. And the credits roll. Now, I... Never- this... It, I'm sorry, but I've seen some bad reboots, but this is unacceptable. Well, from what I heard Man. was that a lot of the fans that read the short story because uh, they said that it well, the remake was closer to it. But, but I a, don't know how the fuck that ends. But like I'm going to tell you right now, if that's a bad thing because Children of Corn, the 84 was an actual fucking theoretical movie. 
This is a full blown movie. This one's trying to favor just the short story. The short story is very short. Yeah. If you're just going by short story, you ain't gonna have much of anything because it's what fucking short story. Right. So you had to change yeah. some things to kind of give it at that. No, length. this wasn't even a full length fucking movie. Almost this is a short fucking movie, dude. Why well, no, it's about fucking, an hour and 20 minutes, something like that. Shit, fucking, like, try an hour and 15, 13 minutes. It was yeah. so fucking short. This is by far one of his, in my opinion, one of Stephen King's worst adaptations. If I could, I don't give zero, zero. I'll give the attempt of the voice thing, but this is a one out of ten for me. Yeah, I haven't seen it, so I can't really say, but... I can only imagine it's even worse as a as a film perspective because of how fucking boring it sounds. Yeah. So, anyways, in the same year we get eighty four, which I believe this is her second film of the franchise uh, or of her debut. She actually didn't, you know, E. T. was her debut. We get Drew Barrymore in Cat's Eye. I haven't seen that one. All right, this film I did see, but keep in mind I seen this in the nineties, so I practically forgot about it. Gotcha. From what I remember, I remember there's a fucking troll dude that keeps fucking poking at her nose. <laughs> so and so, so and so. Can't really judge it. Can't. I totally forgot about it. I do remember this is one of his mixed reviews movies because a lot of people didn't like this film. At yeah, all. and I didn't really care for it either. And not only that, it's another anthology of his. That's what I'm saying. And only one of the stories is dir- directly that from supposedly his. ties together. Yeah, that that, well, that's directed. That's uh, ad, ad, based on one of his stories. Mm-hmm. So I didn't really care about this one. I can't really judge this one. I'm sorry, people. So I can give you a really truly great. Yeah, I can't but either because I haven't really watched it. Now at the same year, I do praise this film of Drew Barrymore, Firestarter. They came out the same year. Yeah. I didn't know they came out the yeah. same year. Yeah. Firestarter. I loved Firestarter. I haven't seen it. Yeah. Drew Barrymore plays this girl who who was being used by a psychiatrist. It's kinda of, it kinda of reminded me of Friday thirteen part seven. Yeah, with the old carry powers. The carry powers where the the psychiatrist like holds her in this like stranger things type thing. She breaks out with her and her father. Her father and her are bums. They're trying to go through City by city, state by state, yeah. not trying to get caught. Care, uh, Firestarter girl, Jerry Barrymore is playing this girl who, you know, when she gets angry, she can start fires and kill people. And she kills people and basically, you know, I'm not trying to go into too much detail. She finally, they finally get caught up. There is emotional impact of this film where her dad sadly passes away. Yeah. Uh, and then Drew Barrymore goes on a fucking Carrie rampage. So this is pretty much, he took a lot of Carrie shit and put it into a girl who can start fire. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Yeah. And basically the girl starts fire and goes nuts and practically, like Carrie, almost pretty much kills herself. You know, just destroying these people that's after her. Ain't much explanation I really can go into this detail. But I remember I enjoyed it. It was a pretty, you know, doable film. I mean, at times it does drag. It becomes a more of a drama film. Well, I remember where I ended up liking it, so I'm going to give that one a 7 out of 10. All righty. Yeah. And then there was that second one, too, they did. I think it was a miniseries. I can't judge any of the sequels at there, all. That was the only one I heard of, was yeah. that Firestarter The Return or something like that. Where she's adult or some yeah. shit, yeah. I it can't was a miniseries, that. not a actual movie. Yeah. So, but here, now we're getting into the good shit. 85, Silver Bullet. I haven't seen it, still need to. I'm going to give you guys the info on this one. I absolutely fucking love this film. This is easily in my top fucking five favorite werewolf films of all time. Yeah. This one actually stars Gary Busey. Um, it stars Corey Haim. Um, a few other characters I remember in this film, but I also remember the guy who plays the werewolf who played the father off People Under the Stairs. Remember that one? Yep. yep. That, you remember him? He plays the werewolf in this one. And he plays a preacher in town, which Corey Haim suspects he is the fucking werewolf. Kids are getting, coming up, torn apart, people. Yeah. Locals are becoming torn apart. He's like, he kind of, it kind of pulls a Fright Night where 
like in Fright Night where he found the vampire at the beginning of the film. He's trying to like, oh my god, I already know who he is, but nobody will believe me. Yeah. That's basically Court Haim in this one where he sees the werewolf. This is a fucking terrifying fucking film because other than American Werewolf in London, this film actually uses the same practical effects as the werewolf. Yeah. And I this werewolf is fucking terrifying. And Gary, Gary Busey kind of plays like a caretaker of Corey Haim, brother, older mm-hmm. brother, I can't remember. But, man, this movie was fucking terrifying, dude. And I highly recommend this. And you know what? There's a lot of people that actually praise this fucking film. And I agree with them. This yeah, is up I hear there. it's actually pretty good. Oh, it is fucking damn good, dude. And it's got a lot of fucking edge in your seats. Like, you're grabbing your seats because well, this werewolf is actually knows that Corey Haim knows who he is, but he taunts him the whole story. I caught a glimpse of at least the ending of it, but I never fully got to finish it. Yeah, it's a pretty fucking scary, it's a pretty terrifying film. Because the werewolf is really fucking haunting him and killing people he loves. But nobody believes Corey Haim. Right? Yeah, it, it, it's a pretty good film. I will set, tell you right now. So, And like I said, it's in my top three favorite werewolf films of all time. So I'm going to give that one a 9 out of 10. There you go. All right. 86. Maximum Overdrive! And here's the funny thing about that one, because this one I can I can talk about as well. Yeah, I too. So yeah. this one, this is actually the first 86. ever directed film by Stephen King. Out of all the adaptations, this is the only one that Stephen King has ever directed himself. Mm-hmm. And so the idea was actually behind of a short of a story he did from one of his books called Trucks, which actually remember that book I was saying about called Night Shift, which they actually did. They actually eventually. did. Uh, well, yeah, they did. They, there's a short story I have in my book called Night Shift by Stephen King yeah. that has that story in there. I haven't read it, but I heard it's interesting. Mm-hmm. So basically, Trucks is basically a short story that was from that from book from 1973. Yeah, yeah. and um, basically Stephen King was basically had the idea that you know what. Since so many people have done so many of my my books, why don't I do it myself? And so he was like, fuck it, I'm going to direct it my own. Yeah. So he ends up getting the chance to direct his own movie. And this is, instead of making a traditional horror film, he decided to basically go balls to the wall and make a fucking fun-ass, great, entertaining flick. Mm-hmm. Like, this film is basically the equivalent of watching, like... An ACDC music video, but mm-hmm. like with so much carnage, mm-hmm. you know, because the soundtrack by this, by ACDC, is fucking kick ass, you know, and this one basically deals. And with, I kind of feel like ACDC kind of stuck their hands in this one. They did. Yeah. And plus, uh, with this story, it's basically, we're kind of getting the idea that a comet comes down and it basically causes everything, including every machine, to pretty much come alive and destroy humans. Yeah. And the way that the film is playing out, it, it's it's kind of taking itself a little serious, but as it goes along, it's basically playing it for fun, yeah. you know. And it's really fucking great because a lot of people hate this movie, including Stink King himself. But I fucking love it. Yeah, you know, it's it's a great fun time. Yeah, and I will tell you right now, like he said, we get we like a lot of other Stephen King's films better than this film. But to me, I think this is one of his most entertaining popcorn fun. I had a fucking blast. Mila Escavez, you have so many fucking big stars. Even the film. girl from uh, who played, uh, who would later play uh, Lisa Simpson, is also in this movie. Is that the annoying voice, bitch? Yeah. Oh man, is that Lisa? that was her? That oh, was her. God, she's annoying. I will give her, dude, great performance in this. ACDC. Balls to the wall. You even had the guy who played uh, like, Commissioner Gordon. This from this Batman. is the type of film that I think that that Stephen King could have had Schwarzenegger, the whole fucking action stars of the eighties, and could have went with muscle as his yeah. like logo, and that would have worked. Yeah, this this was a fucking fun fucking movie. Dude. Oh yeah, definitely. But, and I don't understand the fucking hatred for this. Well, film. because you think about it, the whole concept is things are coming to life. Everything, including cars, machines, things. like I think that. a lot of people's faults in the hate in this film is the fact that Stephen King admitted to this is one of the stories he took a time out, and he actually said, "Have fun." Well, I don't give a fuck. keep in mind too. I've seen the original theatrical trailer of the film. 
And in the trailer, it's basically making King believe that it's supposed to be a, a flat-out horror movie. Because in the trailer, which is funny, because in the trailer, he looks like he's on cocaine. Which King admitted, I think King admitted at least he was on drugs doing this movie. Yeah. Uh, in the trailer, it shows him being like, I just wanted to do something that was being a big, an adaptation of my own book. So I decided to direct it my own. And he, and then in the end of the trailer, he's like, I'm going to scare the hell out of you. Yeah, I don't understand that. He was coked out on this one. He admitted it. And this movie was probably one of Stephen King's most butchered by MPAA. Mm-hmm. Because MPAA, unlike all, all his other films where they kind of really didn't like go into detail or want to take down his films, this one they actually fucking try to butcher his fucking well, movie. Well, yeah, because like you have a scene where a kid is getting actually steamrolled by the steamroller that's going on its own. And he's getting crushed. There was actually a dummy they were going to use that showed like a whole explosion like, of blood, where the brain and, where the brain and everything were pour out. But they, but because the MPA got pissed off, they had to trim it down. Did Supposedly they not- though, they shot it though, but it's, but it's it's lost. I don't get it because MPA also proved a lot of gory shit that same year. I know that's what I'm saying. It's like okay, I suck your dick. I'll let you pass. You didn't suck my dick. I ain't gonna let you pass. That's what it sounds like. That's basically what it is. Maximum Overdrive is still a fucking blast. Yeah. Milo Estevez. Milo Estevez killed it, dude. Soundtrack makes me want to get... Gives me a huge boner. The whole fact that these people are isolated at this gas station having to survive from these... I thought that was a blast. It kind of gives you that trucker type feel. Well, not just that, but I love the Green Goblin truck that comes around. Cool things. Yes, they could have added more to the story. Yeah. A whole lot more. And it kind of contradicts itself in the end, too. Yeah. Because we don't really, like... And they defeat the the villain dude very easy by one shot. So I'll give them that. Yeah. Though the film is a blast. It is, yeah. So what's your grade on Maximum Overdrive? Well, for a fun factor, I'd probably give it maybe a good 8 out of 10. 8 out of 10. I agree with you on that 8 out of 10. So in the same year, in 86, we get Stand By Me. Mm. I... This is one of his first ever films. This is the first time he actually approached. He was approached to make a film that didn't have nothing to do with horror. Yep, this is the first one. It's a straight out drama. Straight, straight out drama. Nothing about horror. It's actually the original Not a monster bo- movie. The original book, the, uh, sorry, novella, is actually called The Body. Yeah, novella, The Body from 1982. Yep. Yep. And, st- and so, Stand By Me, which actually brings a, a big fucking cast. You get the narration of Richard Dreyfus. Richard Dreyfus. It stars Rob Rainier. Uh, Will Wilton, R- R- uh, River Phoenix, Corey Feldman, and Jerry O'Connell is a fat boy yeah. in this one. And this is about a story about these boys, and Keith or Southern's in this. It's about a story about these kids, you know, you got your uh, your typical 50s kids that ain't got nothing to do in their little foreign town of Oregon. Yeah. And another film that he actually takes out of Maine. Mm-hmm. He actually goes to Oregon here. And basically these boys are pretty much bored, ain't got nothing to do, they're born life. A boy becomes missing in this uh, storyline. A boy becomes missing. They don't know if he's dead. They think he got hit by a train. Suspect. They don't know. And they're given a reward to find this kid dead or alive. And these ki- and these group of five kids decide let's you know do a, a, one last summer together because basically we're all the, Corey Feldman and his group are talking about how they're gonna. It's like a Goonies. It's basically Goonies. Yeah. Goonies of more drama. Yeah. And basically the kids are accepting that they're going to be separated during the school year. Yeah. You got, you know, so and so is going to move to this state and this so and so is going to do this. This is their final time to be together. They decide to go on a adventure to find this kid dead alive. And at the same time, you got the town bully played by Keith or Sutherland. Who's basically saying, you know, oh, there's money involved. Oh, we're going to find them before them do. Yeah. And basically, it's like this all-out adventure going through, you know, kind of like your Homer Bound. Going through mountain lions. You got, you, you run into fucking uh, leeches. Just your, you know, your very standard drama. You know, it's a fun kid film. It's an adventure film. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it leads to them finding, unfortunately, the kid's dead body. And, you know, you got Keith or Sutherland who's willing to kill these kids. To get the reward, and it gets heated, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but later in the story, as they find the kid dead after all the adventures, these kids go into a deeper story. Richard Dreyfuss plays the main kid, 
named Shane, who talks about the story as he narrates it all along, and he talks about years later after they find the kid, and he actually becomes a writer and writes the book of yeah. how they found. And it's cool because instead of called Stand by Me, he's actually writing the book called The Body. Yeah, which is interesting because yeah. the he goes, I'm which, gonna call it The Body, which I. Okay, I yeah. haven't seen the full movie. Like I've seen most yeah. of it. I just have had little parts I haven't seen. Yeah. Why is the film called Stand By Me? I I mean, it, of it's body. about instead of the body, it's about a unitation of five kids, best friends, who instead of separating, they've been best friends since birth. Okay. So they hug each other. Stand by me. We're here to the end. Got you. Yeah, and it was a very beautiful story. And I believe Stephen King actually praised the fuck out he of did. this one. He did. He actually, uh, from what I read, Stephen King actually said out of the adaptations, he said that's the only, that's the first one that has yes. been the best adaptation of his work. That well, it's he not said, like that. Well, he said that's the closest to his book. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is his top five best books ever written. And it's his best movies ever adaptation. Easily the best. Five, yeah. Top five, and it was only it was one of his few non horror yes. films that uh, that came out that was released that people were thrown off like what? It's that? a very emotional film, and the score in there kind of reminds me of Drive type film. It kind of has like a Drive type score to it, yeah, and it has very emotional score to it. it it's a very emotional film, especially when Richard Dreyfuss grows up to be old age, where he plays the main guy Shane. He talks about. Sadly, losing some of the their buddies. Yeah, um, like uh, River Phoenix's character at the end of the film, he talks about he grew up. He was thirty two. He was in a bar. Unfortunately, he tried to break up a bar fight. He was stabbed in the throat and died instantly. I saw that yeah. part. That was yeah. pretty sad. It's a pretty sad film, dude. And I will tell you right now, it's a very emotional film. I thank God my parents showed me this. They said it was beautiful fucking storyline. And fortunately for me. I actually been to where they shot the film. You so, have, yeah. Yes, and I took pictures of it. And I was so happy to be there, man. Great to take some scenes from that, dude. I'm gonna tell you right now, this is one of his ten out of ten stories. Yeah, this movie I give it ten out of ten. Yeah, from what I remember, at least watching most yeah. of it, because this is like my Goonies part. This two. is like a film that I probably need to go back and rewatch. But from what I remember, I really enjoyed it, so I probably would have given it a ten out of ten as well. Oh yeah, dude, it was an amazing fucking film, dude. Because, I mean, it's it's one of those movies that, to this day, that's one of his adaptations I don't really think they should ever remake. Because that, that that's one that is stands so great, there's no reason to do another adaptation of it. No, there's not. So, it, this is one of those movies that I kind of look at Jaws. You can't even touch this movie. And I, yeah. I guarantee there's a lot of people who believe me in this one. So, we skip some years later. We skip a year later after that phenomenal award-winning Stand By Me. We get 87's Lawnmower Man. This is you. Lawn, wait, you mean Running Man? The Lawnmower Man. Wait, it was 87? Wait a minute. 1987. Oh, no, 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 no. This this is a short story film. Oh, uh, that's actually the that. original short film that they did based on the short story of the Lawnmower Man, which is actually the closest to the short story because when we get to it later... The Lawnmower Man that's from the 90s has nothing to do with the Stephen King story. Okay. So that's a different film that you're talking about. 87 Running Man. That's Running Man? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, I did not I, see this. So I've watched it. bits and pieces. From what I remember, I know the general premise. It's about where Arnold Schwarzenegger is wrongfully convicted of, basically of, uh, I think he was wrongfully convicted. Basically, he's caught in this, he's having to do, compete in this tournament. That is basically a free for all battle where you have to pretty much kill all your opponents in order to survive. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's the equivalent of member of the Hunger Games and all them. Mm -hmm. It's this is basically the original version. Yeah. Um, and basically, from what I gather from fans, they said that some of the changes they made was that in the beginning of the film, um, Arnold's character has a different motivation compared to the book. <laughs> so in the book, it was a lot different. Mm -hmm. Uh. I don't really much know much about it because honestly, I haven't really fully watched the finish the film, so I can't really judge it. Okay. Okay. So that was the Running Man. I can't judge it either. All right. Next up, 1989. Easily one of my top six favorite of Stephen King's of all time. 
This one is in my top six as far as horror films. This is probably one of his best horror films, in my opinion, because this movie holds a dear close to my heart. I absolutely think that this was a 100% well-written film, Pet Cemetery. Yes, 89's definitely. 89's Pet Cemetery. This film not only can grab you by the horror, but it grabs you by probably the most emotional you've ever seen as far as kid dying in a film. Absolutely. Now, this film, when I was little, I used to have a lot of a uh, hard time watching it for the scary parts because... Well, not only that, the because, subject matter of a pet cemetery. Well, that's what you I'm saying. You have a pet yeah, and he a, dies. A pet dying, yeah, of that yeah. alone. Um, so, when I was younger, this movie used to terrify me a lot. Um, mm -hmm. It was definitely a, a film that I grew up watching, and in this, even this day, it always still not only made me terrified, but also feel emotional as well. And it's about... Um, um, well, you had that guy from Monsters. Mm -hmm. One of his... Other than... Um, the Joe Pesci one with the lawyer. Yeah, that was. I think this was the other one that. Yeah, he this did. is with the judge from that one. The judge, and this is that when he did the judge off of. Uh, God, what what was that movie called? He did the judge from Cousin Vinny. Cousin Vinny and this was like his last two films. I think so. Yeah. Before he died, Frank Gwynn, I think his name was. Yeah, Frank Gwynn. I think those were. Like, I think. Cousin Vinny was his initial last role. Yeah. It and then he passed it. Yeah, it was 92. He, yeah. And then he passed away. But this but, one, yeah, this one deals with uh, a family. The family called Creed. Yeah, the where they're basically... They, a, he's a doctor that transferred out there. Yeah. And one day they end up having... They end up having... Uh, losing their pet. Uh, I think uh, it was like uh, the dog. Well, no, what, what it, it starts cat. out with, they move into town from far away... And they move in this little main town where they buy this house from the this old dude from the Munsters. And uh, they buy this house and he uh, the husband's a doctor. And I remember the first scene, he's working at that hospital, the university hospital. That guy got ran over. Yeah, I remember that. He got his brain squashed. Yeah, that fucking, fucking shit was brutal. And it showed like fucking detail of fucking gore. Well, he ends up passing away. Well, he's trying to get to know, you know, the neighbor across the street. And at the same time, they had this really psycho-ass fucking maid. Yeah, I remember that. That ends up hanging herself in her fucking, in their house and shit. Yeah. In their cellar, which is fucking creepy. Well, it was funny because that cat becomes an iconic cat that a lot of people look at and be like, oh, God, it's fucking church. Yeah. You know, you see a great cat, you think of church. The cat that fucking dies from getting ran over. Yeah. And it's this this road is like really busy with speeding trucks, and it kills the cat. They bear, uh, and then the old man comes and says, "Hey, he goes, I got a place because he noticed the kids are distraught over losing the cat. Yeah. He goes, I got a place for it. I'm gonna tell you where it's at. And he shows him one day, and it's pet cemetery. There's the cat there. The cat, you know, gets buried. Then comes back, you know. Then, for some reason, the cat comes back to life, and you're like, but the cat's more evil this time. And at the same time that's going on, you get that. Oh, my God, it's so fucking... Dude, to this day, I'm sorry, it fucking hits me. Because I have a fuck. I have kids. Dude, I, that scene can't help but make me cry, dude. Where Gage gets ran over. That was one of the most heartbreaking scenes I think right that's there. probably, like... I think that's easily the top three most heartbreaking scenes of cinema history. Yeah, that was one of the most emotional scenes out of a Stephen King film. And I can feel for Creed, where he's sitting there screaming. He watches his little boy, because I cannot stand Atticus or Evan, my boy, dying. Dude, that is so fucking... Oh my god, it tear me apart. Yeah. Dude, dude and I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a father, this movie... Get you more than if you're not a father. Yeah. Trust me. Trust me. Be a father. And then this movie really fucking gets you, dude. Yeah, it, it does. really does to this day. It's like, oh my God, that fucking terrifies me. And then you're burying your fucking son. Mm -hmm. And then basically your family falls apart. Your kid, le your family leaves you. And then you, you go nuts and you bury your kid in Pet Cemetery. It brings back your kid. Who goes psycho and fucking slaughters your fucking neighbor. But then before that, your neighbor goes into fucking great flashbacks of how they buried his sister there. 
And then that that then you go into details where the wife is talking about her crippled sister, which that woman scares the fuck out of me to this day. Yeah. The one that goes, "Yeah, I'm gonna take you back." Yeah, and then there was the other one where the where uh, the the dad is 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 seeing visions of the, the 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 zombie guy, the kid that that got ran over at the beginning of the movie. Yeah, yeah, in that bike rack. Yeah, because he was buried and he's got brains pouring out. Yeah, this movie was fucking graphic, dude. Not only that, man, it showed like scenes where like Gage tore in that old dude's throat and ripped it open. Yeah, it cut it open. And it was like, man, and he sat there choking on his blood. But like, it showed Gage saw his legs. Yeah, with that fucking little butcher knife thing, and that boy was like, <laughs> like it. It was like Pennywise in that fucking room. Yeah, it and the like boy's it. like Chucky meets Pennywise. He's smiling and laughing, dude. And then like the father has to sit there and fucking inject that shit dude and then like the <laughs> father ends up like this is one of the stories i think this is one of the only like stories where it didn't have a happy ending where it ended where the father even died well yeah because leaving the the, the 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 daughter fucking orphaned yeah because the 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 because the the, the mother father. ends up killing gage because well though the gage killed the wife too yeah, and then the, he buried the wife in pet cemetery, and the wife came back. Yeah, and slaughtered him. Well, yeah, because At the end of the well, because he ended up having to kill Gage because he gives him that shot. Mm-hmm. That and the boy cries. Dude. That movie is a fucking that whole emotional. scene when he gives him that shot right there at the end. Yeah. That still gets me on t- almost tears. Yeah, it does, man. And this is I'm gonna tell you right now, dude. Pet cemetery. Is easily in the top six, top five best films. It's as far as horror. Yeah. A lot of his films that do make his top five are at, are not as horror films. Yeah. But this one, dude, I think this is probably, in my opinion, I think this is his best horror film. I think it is, too. Well, I still also have The Shining on there, too. But I Well, was... yeah. I, I kind of give Kubrick the praise on that one. But if I did add because we are adding to adaptations... I had that one in Pet Cemetery tied. Yeah, Pet Cemetery. I, I feel like I it, think one that my, was one of my favorites. Of well, and I think for and it was funny too because Sting King is himself is also in that film. He's also playing the uh, the, more, the, the guy burying the guy burying. Yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna tell you right now, not counting Green Mile, Shawshank, Stand by Me, and you know Secret Window and a lot of his non horror films that do make top. If I had to write his horror films, I think Pet Cemetery, other than Shining, I think Pet Cemetery is the best. Yeah, I mean, too, because done. that ain't, because that film touched me on so many levels. In fact, that's also a horror film of his that I really can't see be remade. Like, no. No, no, I, that's what I argued with the other night. I was like, dude, this is one of those films that only fits of his time. And this is the one film that Andy wants to touch. Yeah. No, please, Andy, please, not that. This film is not meant to rebate. It was so fucking good. Yeah. You can't, I'm sorry, dude. Andy could top the new it, but he can't top this pet cemetery. Yeah. I'll put money on it. I'll put a, I'll put $500 on it right now that he can't top the fucking original. I mean, it's, yeah, I don't doubt. I mean, he's, uh, he can beat it. But he ain't beating this one. There's some movies that need to be probably a better. We'll get to it soon, but I'm just saying that we'll. That's There's probably, some films that he can remake, but this but is not this so is long. one that I really don't see. Being I think remade. it doesn't need to be it remade, to. dude. It's it holds up its time, dude. And to this day, the Pet Cemeteries are the best from the '90s and '80s. Yeah, they cannot. Be oh, played. speaking of which, I haven't watched it yet, but he's seen the sequel. Yeah. Well, let me give my first grade of Pet Cemetery. Dude, I think this is only one of the few times other than Shining I actually gave Steve King's horror film as a film a 10 out of 10. Fair enough. Yeah. I think this is one of his best. Yeah, it's the same I thing think. with me because I love the mm-hmm. film so much that I have little or no I have really I no, have no flaws. flaws. I had no flaws. So I have a... This movie captured me in every level. I even fucking cried in the movie. Yeah, so with that, I give it a good 10 out of 10 as well. Yeah, Pet Cemetery. So they decided to do a part two of the fucking movie. And believe it or not, this yeah. came out uh 1991, which came out around the same time that Terminator 2 was coming out. Yeah, so this is... uh Yeah, yeah this is... um. Whenever part two came out, um, uh, around, like you said, Terminator came out. Because Edward Furlong was in both movies. Yeah, 
and he shot basically both of them back to back. Yeah. So yeah, this is uh, when uh, nineteen ninety two, right? Uh, ninety one, I believe. No, ninety two. Oh, okay, it was ninety two yeah. then. So. And this is based off his sequel to the nineteen eighty nine version. It was directed by Mary Lambert. This one actually yeah. starred Clancy Brown. As the cop. The guy who played, uh, who was funny because he played another Stephen mm-hmm. King movie called mm-hmm. Shawshank Redemption. This one actually has a big cast. This one actually has Clancy Brown, Edward Furlong, and Anthony Edwards from Revenge of Nerds. Yep. As the father of Edward Furlong. This one was, to this day, is a very, very underrated sequel. I haven't seen it yet, but I heard that, you know, based on what he's been telling me, that it's actually not that bad. It's not that bad, and a lot of people actually agree with me on this one. I'm not trying to brag about that, but it is what it is, you know. Yeah. People do agree with me on this one. So this one actually takes place, I believe, five years after the events. Five to ten years, I believe. Yeah, it was after about... The, yeah, of the events of part one. And... Um, Furlong loses his mom at the beginning, which is a very emotional scene, where his mom is an actor, and she gets electrocuted to death at the beginning of the film, and he watches his mom suffer electrocution and dies. Well, later in the film, after losing his mom, his dad said, you know what, because his dad's a veterinarian, he goes... We'll be right back here in a second. Hold on, hold on. Pause that. So yeah, he was his mom ends up dying at a tragic death. She's an actor. Yeah. Edward Furlong went to go visit his mom, and his mom ends up tragically dying. So his dad goes, "We need to start a new life. You know, start over." So they moved that same town off of Pet Cemetery One. Yeah. They move there. He becomes a vet, his dad's a veterinarian there, and uh, Edward Furlong. And this one I really like because they do that whole Nirvana grunge rock music yeah. in this one, which is pretty fucking cool. And in this one, they do like where he Edward Furlong's kind of getting bullied. He he's friends with this fat kid in school, and they get bullied by this one fucking dude that looks like Jerry. I swear to God, I thought it was Jerry Rim. Rimmer until recently it wasn't I thought it was really him as a kid well anyways Clancy Brown is playing the father of the fat kid who is a local cop yeah and what's interesting is that Clancy Brown would also later play uh, uh, Hadley in uh, Shawshank Redemption which is also based on Stephen King yep and it's coming up and so he plays um, the cop in town in the same town and it's pretty cool because they actually talk about the events of part one. How there was an old man that got killed, slaughtered by a little baby. And this bully is like taunting Edward Furlong and this fat kid. And he goes, he, and they do, and, and it's, and you know what I love about this film? It's set around Halloween time. They actually promote Halloween. Oh, it is? Yeah. Dressing well, up in that. costumes instead. Hmm. And like, and they dress up and they go to the pet cemetery to have a, bonfire and drink and party hard and there's a part where this fucking bully is like he he actually tells the events of part one. Oh wow goes, you know there's a legend that happened seven years ago the creed family lived here yeah and they buried their kid named gage and he actually describes every event for verbatim kind of bringing in part one into it instead of forgetting about it. Yeah. And then that's when Clancy Brown shows up and he's like a fucking dickhead ass fucking cop. He's like, all right, kids, you're going to jail and all that bullshit. Well, then um, the Clancy Brown's youngest son owns a fucking husky, some husky dog, and the dog actually kills Clancy Brown with a ripping throat. It actually shows, shows like the skin getting torn out. It shows all the gore and throats and stuff. Wow, it sounds like they can Clancy Brown dies. In this too. Yeah, it is. It, it, it feels like that. So, anyways, Clancy Brown ends up dying. Well, they the bullies leave Edward Furlong and the fat boy together, and they can't kind of kind of kind of feel like okay, we can be charged for murder. 
So let's bury my dad. Mm. So they bury the dad in Pet Cemetery. He comes back. Mm. And they say, oh my God, the 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 rule, the things are true. My dad's back. But then the dad goes slowly nuts. He starts fucking like torturing families and shit. Well, he starts killing in town people, including the bullies. And then he buries them in Pet Cemetery and then recruits them. Oh, shit. Yeah, and then it becomes like an army of fucking killers. And then Edward Furlong, even though his dad is like, you know, doesn't believe in Clancy Brown's, like, you know, goes, oh, you you look fucked up and all that shit. Edward Furlong kind of falls in love with, he kind of brainwashes Edward Furlong. Edward Furlong goes and gets his mother. Oh, he does? From Los Angeles and buries her in Pet Cemetery, bring her back. Mm. And dude... I'm going to tell you right now, dude. Give it a shot, dude. It is a fucking damn good sequel. Underrated fucking sequel, in my opinion. I need to Not check- better than the first one, by all means, but god damn good sequel. I know. I, I hear that it's actually yeah, not too bad. It's not too bad, dude. It's a solid out of 10 for me. It's a very good sequel. That's cool, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm going to check it out. You take a cat and... What Gage is a fucking villain in the first one, yeah. and you up the anthem and you do more adults. He's building like, yeah. an army, and it actually shows fucking a lot gore in part two. Like it shows like the part where he's fighting, like Clancy Brown is like, "Oh, you're gonna fuck." He kills his own kid too. Oh shit! His own ki- children and shit, and he kills like this bully dude. He takes this goddamn fucking motorcycle, and it shows the kid's face getting torn off. Like, mm. ripped off, like, fucking, like, goddamn fucking, like, Two-Face type shit. <laughs> Damn. And then, like, the kid comes back, he's, like, all... <laughs> like that, like, he recruits him and shit. Yeah, it's pretty fucking scary, dude. Two actually, in a scary to point, two actually kind of terrified me more than one on the scary department. So, I will say, two, eight out of ten, man, I thought it was a great fucking sequel, dude. Yeah. I mean, I'll check it out when I can. I mean, I, I've heard a lot about it. I just never seen it. Yeah. You think they'll ever do a Pet Cemetery three? Nah, I mean that was good closure, man. It does do like a hint, like hey, maybe, maybe, <laughs> but uh, I don't think they need to do it. But anyways, yeah, the Pet Cemeteries, dude. I think they're his more were unlike Children of Corns, where they get worse, or any of his other movies he did sequels get worse. I think Pet Cemetery stayed consistent on that. Yeah. So, anyways, that was eighty nine. So we get to nineteen ninety. Tales from the Dark Side. This is you. So, Tales from the Dark Side. The movie is it's actually an adaptation of the popular TV series called the Tales from the Dark Side. Now, the interesting thing about this, the reason why I include this, is because King actually had a hand in writing some of the the screenplay on this film. Mm-hmm. By writing, because in the film they have three segments, I believe, that are then in a wraparound story that bookends both mo- the movie. And uh, the three ser- stories they tell, um, I believe, if, I think it was three or four. Um, yeah, I think it was three. Yeah. Um, the three stories they tell in this film are actually pretty cool because basically King wrote one of the stories in the film, and one of them is actually the one called The, the Cat or whatever. From Hell. Yeah, the cat from hell, and it uh, it was based on one of his works. Mm. Um, the other two are specifically for the film. But the interesting is the, the 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 reason why I bring this up is because behind the scenes they actually say that uh, Tom Savini actually quoted that this is considered the real Creep Show three because mm-hmm. Stephen King actually wrote the script for this one, and George Romero also had a hand in producing the film as well. Mm-hmm. So. Because them two were pretty much involved, all three of them were pretty much involved, yeah. they basically said that this one was more like uh, the true sequel to Creepshow 2, or the first two Creepshow movies. And this one also has an anthology format, because this one also had three stories like Creepshow 2 did. Mm. Um, and this one had the three stories that they had, including King's one. The first story involves uh, basically this... Uh, tale of a guy who's who's trying to get this story or or yeah it's basically trying to get the story involved or whatever and it has to deal with steve it has like some really uh well knowns at the time like steve buscemi christian mm-hmm. slater and even julianne moore's in it mm-hmm. um it's a great story um i don't want to go too detailed because i want to i don't want to read the twist 
But the second story is the one King uh, wrote, where basically the whole gimmick is that there's a cat that is killing people inside this house. And this old man that lives there, the guy, remember the guy who played off of Mouse Hunt, the old man the in the wheelchair? Yeah. Well, yeah. He, he's in this one. Um, he basically hires a hitman to go kill this cat. The entire that's the entire yeah. segment of the story was that this this cat is killing people and he's trying to hire this hitman to kill it. Yeah. Then the third story involves uh, that fucking creepy one I showed you. Remember you were at my ha- our house that one night. Basically, this story involves this segment involves uh, this guy. He's like at this bar or whatever. He's waiting to meet some guy. And then in the alley, uh, some dude gets killed by this weird gargoyle looking motherfucker. And uh, he gets fucking his head torn off and shit. You remember that? That I showed you. I think you did. I think it. I think it did. We're showing yeah, the dark cargo- side. I'm really tales of the dark side. I am really fucking pieces on this one. I haven't really, really. Fully but you saw that part where yeah. we show the gargoyle rip its head off. Mm-hmm. Well, this one, this segment was pretty depressing because not going to reveal it, but basically there's a great twist behind it with this character uh, as it goes along because he meets this beautiful woman after that that uh, has like a that she kind of has a dark side to herself. So, great movie. Um, it's definitely, you know, it's definitely not great. Because I'm, I'm I'm more interested with the first and third segments. The second the second segment that's King actually wrote is really my least favorite. But yeah. it's still a good movie. So, so with that, I'd probably give it, like, probably a mm, solid 7.5 out of 10. 7.5 out of 10. So. All right, we'll be right back. Uh, when we come back, we will do 1990s Graveyard Shift. Yeah, which we both saw. Yeah, which we both saw, and he introduced me. Oh, well, he didn't introduce me. I actually knew about it, but I didn't give it until you moved in with me and we decided to watch it together. Yeah. To get me kind of revived on it. So, we'll we'll be right back on that. Yeah, we'll definitely come back on that. So, we hope you ever, for those of you who have been listening uh, to our uh, discussion, feel free to like and subscribe if you've been, you know, enjoying this. We'll be coming back with part three of our discussion here soon. So, we'll see you guys later. Later.